Hello and welcome to this edition of NBC News. Haley, it's our second semester of our senior year and I cannot believe it. Millie, I know, right? I mean, I'm gonna miss Mason so much, but one of the things I love about Mason is how we're such a community and you could totally see that over winter break when a pet went missing. Reporter Riley Malloy has the story. On January 2nd, the hearts of the evil family broke as they set down their brand new puppy to go to the bathroom and didn't see her again for eight days. Sweetie, a one and a half year old Pomeranian, had been in the hands of Jackson Ebel for two hours before she ran away and sent the Mason community, with the help of social media, on a heartwarming chase to bring her home. Sweetie was found on January 10th, surviving almost zero degree weather with little food, water, and shelter for eight days until she was found under a bush in a heritage golf course. Her family feels as though it is a miracle she is home. So we got home from the breeder and I let her out to go to the bathroom and right away she started bolting down the street and I chased her and then she went through woods and I couldn't get through as fast enough and that's when we lost her and we started posting flyers around. I had to tell my parents and for about eight days she was just lost and we thought she was going to die somewhere, you know, curled up somewhere because it was so cold outside. We were even freezing. Surprisingly, when we got her back, when someone at Heritage found her, in a bush by their house, we got her back and we brought her to the vet. She was perfectly fine and I thought, and that's just a miracle. Sweetie's story was plastered across Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, and other social medias. Abby Mullen says that seeing her story on the internet was how she knew she was missing and helped bring her home. When it was posted on Facebook, my mom, I think, reposted it, and then I saw it, and then I also took the picture and I put it on Twitter just to spread the word because there's some old friends and we just wanted to help them out and find Sweetie. So my mom picked her up because it was only about 10 minutes from her work. She was the fastest person to get to her. So when we found her, we wanted to make sure that she was okay, so we took her right to the vet, and they said everything was fine with her. She was not, she didn't even, like, look bad, like, um, her paws and everything were fine. We thought she would be like lethargic and she seemed great. So um, then we took her home and it was exciting to see. Um, my mom got to see it actually. I had to go to practice, but Jackson and everybody was so excited to finally see her after eight days. It was crazy. Sweeney survived treacherous conditions and with people from ages 7 to 87 looking, the Mason community helped bring her home. Through the power of social media, a community set aside their own struggles and helped reunite a family. Sweetie is now happy and healthy and has found her forever family. I'm Riley Malloy, NBC News. The power of social media, Haley, it's incredible that they were able to bring Sweetie home. I totally agree, Millie. I don't know what I'd do if I lost my dog because I just love animals so much. Yeah, and so does freshman TJ Chapman. He has his own gecko breeding business online. Reporter Morgan Baker has the story. There's all kinds of pet lovers out there. You've got your dog lovers, cat lovers, those people who just love their horses, and of course, you've got those who love their lizards. Yeah, I said lizards, but more specifically, geckos. Freshman TJ Chapman is so infatuated with his geckos that he started his own business of breeding and selling them. I started this business because I needed a way to make money for all my other hobbies that I had, which were a lot. And... Um, I already had a leopard gecko, like I said, and their reptiles is a big passion of mine. Chapman started this business because he needed a way to make money for all the other hobbies that he had. I decided to breed geckos instead of any other animals because I already had a leopard gecko, and um, other animals just seem to do or need more work than uh, leopard geckos. They're pretty much beginner pets. The way that we sell them is we have a website called geckosandmasons.com. And it basically is our website of that lists all our food, all our products. Um, we sell other companies' products like for the same price that they would sell them for, but we buy them in like bulk. And then um, we also sell our geckos on there individually as they come in. Chapman definitely has found a way to link his passion for geckos with his business sense. It's rare you see students who can combine their love for pets and turn it into a money-making enterprise. And who knows, you could see one of TJ's geckos on a TV ad selling car insurance someday. I'm Morgan Baker, NBC News. Millie, I'm telling you, TJ is going to be rich one day. We are definitely going to have to follow up with him about his gecko breeding business. For sure. Speaking of follow-ups, Kaylee Connors hit the cafeteria yet again to give us an update on the fries. 
At first, I very much disliked the fries, but now they're okay. I would say that I like the, actually, I don't really like them as much as the old ones, but I didn't like the old ones either. They're, they're crispy. Um, I think they have improved in quality and texture and flavor. I didn't think they were that different besides the spices, and I mean, they're okay, but they really weren't that great. Amazing spices, right. and they're no, amazing. they're fat, and they taste uncooked. No, but the potato adds good flavor. So I really like these fries a lot more because they're perfectly seasoned now, and they aren't as hard. They're more soft, and they taste more fresh. If you recall the September broadcast, we did a story on the widely disliked new fries at lunch. Not long after that story was released, the fries had been changed again, and although they are still getting mixed reviews, Sarah Burkhart, kitchen manager at MHS, says that the student's opinion really does matter. We changed the French fries this year due to a couple different reasons. One, we changed the method in which we cook. Um, we stopped frying due to government regulations, and we're baking them. And the product that we had previously that we were frying with didn't work very well baking. Um, the students didn't receive them well, they didn't have much flavor, so we had to look into a more um, flavorful fry that fit into the government guidelines. We actually love when the kids give us feedback on the, on the products that we serve, um, especially with new products like the fries we had taste testing before we brought them in full term. Um, and the reason that is because you guys are our customers. Um, if you guys don't like it, there's no sense in us serving it, cooking it, preparing it, and spending the time on it. Um, and just like any restaurant, they want to focus on what the student or what the customer wants. Whether you pack or buy, lunch is an important part of the day. Lunch ladies here at MHS want to make sure that you're enjoying what you're eating. I'm Kaylee Connors, NBC News. Haley, it's so admirable that the cafeteria workers listened to what the students wanted. Exactly, Millie, and it's also great how administration listened to what the students wanted when approving the Sadie Hawkins dance. Shannon McCalmont has the story. Once a character from an old school comic who encouraged women to get what they want, Sadie Hawkins is now the talk of Mason High School. Sadie Hawkins dance is for a dance to go to for girls to ask guys, and we haven't done that in the past. I think it's mostly because, you know, we have a lot of things going on in January and February where it's hard to just have another dance, so I think this is a great opportunity for all of us to come together. And then also another big reason for us is that Sugo usually runs, or always does, run homecoming. And so we thought it'd be great to combine with SIBS and NHS, which is like the three biggest clubs at MHS. And it's a great bonding experience for all of us to come together to create a dance for all of you guys. Dance co-chair Lindsay Wellage believes that the theme of our winter formal goes against society's norms, but overall is a great way for girls to take initiative. It's very empowering, I think, for a girl to ask a guy when, you know, for prom or for homecoming, Usually, like, a guy will ask a girl, which, I mean, sometimes it does happen where there's a girl will ask a guy, but I think that it, it makes you kind of go out of your comfort zone to ask another guy, because I think, you know, sometimes the girls are just waiting for a guy to ask. Student Activity Director Lori Fox Allen explains her hopes for how this dance will be different from Homecoming. Well, my hope on how it's going to be different than Homecoming is it's, it's not, you have to go out and, and buy a dress that, you know, is, is bedazzled and and extravagant, that, that it can be a simple dress and be casual. The budget for it is much different than homecoming. Um, we're really just trying to keep it simple. Sadie Hawkins may be from an old comic, but it also may be a new tradition at Mason High School. Some people may get the courage to ask that special someone, but either way, everyone can have fun at this simple dance. I'm Shannon McCalmont, NBC News. So, Millie, are you asking anyone to Sadie's? Um, I don't really know. It seems like you're hesitating. Yeah, I kind of um, do that a lot. And actually, Riley Johansson has a story about vocal pauses. Um, so... Uh, um, like... Uh... Uh... uh yeah. Uh, uh... So... Uh... Um, so they, like, um, can, like, um... <laughs> Vocal pauses. We all use them. Whether it be in a presentation or a conversation in general, it seems like it just can't be avoided. But why do we do it, and how can we stop it? Andrew Getz teaches FCA, a class that focuses on presentations and public speaking. Getz believes that the importance of public speaking is based on the awareness of what we're saying and how to fix it. Some students come in with a feeling of anxiety about doing public presentations, public speaking presentations. And my job primarily is just to remind the students that they're going to be able to do successfully what they already know how to do. The biggest thing that I can help them with, I think, or one of the biggest things relative to speech presentations, is 
helping students to become attuned to their own vocal pauses. And one of the ways that we do that here in FCA is when the students are practicing with one another, I'll have them give some kind of a visual cue every time their partner, the partner does the presentation, every time the partner does a vocal pause, an um or an uh, the person gives them a visual cue. And it just tunes your ears into whatever vocal pauses that you're doing. When we vocal pause, it gives a nonverbal piece of communication that says, I'm not quite sure of the answer that I'm giving yet. It's one of those things that's kind of fun for me as a teacher. When you have somebody up there doing a presentation, and they vocal pause, but they hear their own vocal pause, and then they and they react to it. So, for example, they'll be up there. Okay, so I'm going to do my presentation, and um, oh, oh, I just oh, um, no, 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 don't count that. You know, and that's the kind of thing that, that happens. And so that's that's a happy thing for me because then I know that the student is becoming aware of his or her vocal pauses, and once you're aware of it, you can change it. Speech and debate teacher Melissa Donahue sees success in her students and how they improve their skills. She understands that the most effective component of good speech is the practice that comes along with it. Definitely, I think the students have been improving. Uh, they've, they've been getting better and better uh, to the point of um, really competing with a lot of the collegiate level students. I see that with a lot of students in my speech and debate class, as well as kids that actually compete in speech and debate uh, with the idea of a lot of vocal pauses that seem to get in the way and uh, slow students down at times. I think probably the, the big issues surrounding the vocal pauses is the fact that it, it tends to kind of lose credibility for the speaker. But a big thing that I also stress is just really knowing your material and, and practicing it over and over again. I think it probably goes back to believing in what that person is saying or uh, you know being able to understand them and the more the vocal pausing happens the more that starts to take away from what the student is actually saying. While we may not hear them most of the time, our vocal pauses are still there, but becoming aware is the key. If we continue to listen to our voices more, we'll get even closer to getting 100 on that presentation. I'm Riley Johansson, um, NBC News. For the Mason Swimming Program, winning and losing isn't all that defines them. Haley Dardis brings us the story of how the swim team gave back to the Boy Scouts. Usually at this time on a Saturday morning, the Mason High School swim team can be found practicing at their home pool. But once a season, they can be found making a splash at the Melrose YMCA, teaching the Boy Scouts how to swim. Swimming with the Boy Scouts is an event that all of these Mason athletes look forward to every year. This is especially true for senior Harrison Wright, who really enjoys the experience. So pretty much at the beginning, we're like assigned with each group. We get in, we teach them just like the basics of like how to swim and we learn like what level they're at of swimming. And then halfway, we'll do like fun relays to show them how we're swimming and they'll get all excited. And then we reconnect and we do like more fun little things like we'll get the pool noodles out and stuff like that. And then towards the end, they'll do like their little fun relays. Hopkins program director Steve Alexander recalls that this event has been going on for 15 years and says that this opportunity to learn from the Mason swimmers is great for the Boy Scouts of the Cincinnati area. The chance really it was started for the boys to uh, get their swimming requirements done in the winter uh, for their rank advancement. Uh, for some boys it's just an introduction to swimming. Uh, we get all range of skill levels here. Some boys can't even put their face uh, in the water. Uh, they, and so we try to work it so that they can uh, do that and we try to move them up a level, teach them how to float, uh, kick, uh, uh, do basic swim strokes and stuff like that. Plus the important thing is we're going to make sure they all have fun. Last year I really connected with this kid named Laquez. Um, he was in my group um, with a couple other kids. and. He did not want to put his head underwater, didn't want to like swim at all, but like towards the end, um, after like teaching him how to like blow bubbles and kick, he like loved the water, didn't want to get out, and I just thought that was like a great experience and how we connected. The Comet swimmers are accustomed to high intensity practices and meets all season long, but this opportunity to swim with the Boy Scouts once a year gives them the chance to take a step back and dive into the pool with a greater purpose. I'm Haley Dardis, NBC Sports. Speaking of giving back, 
the entire Mason School District got together to give back to another worthy cause through a game of basketball. Abby Miller has the story. The Mason community is used to watching varsity basketball games, with the Comets competing with hopes of reaching state levels. But this game is different. This game means more than just a win or loss. It means including everyone and helping the community. This game is an exhibition between the Cincinnati Royals wheelchair basketball team and teachers and administration from around the Mason Schools District. All proceeds go to Common Ground, an all-inclusive playground for people of all abilities. The founder of Common Ground, Rachel Kotfler, believes that this will positively affect the community in numerous ways. I think it'll show everybody you know, what things that we take for granted every day, and I think that it'll also show that just because someone has a disability that they really can still be very active and still get out and enjoy a lot of things and just get out and have a good time. I have a set of triplets that are in eighth grade now, but one of them has a uh, special need with a spinal cord defect, and so we saw how well he did with his typical siblings and thought that it would be neat to create a place like that for all kids. Adam Ayers, a player on the Cincinnati Royals, can see the impact this game will make on him and his family's life. My family, uh, you know, being a person with a disability that uses a wheelchair, my wife as well, and then I have a son with a disability. Um, one out of my three kids, you know, is disabled. Having a playground like this that I could go to and be able to have, a, you know, a, an environment where all my kids can play with one another and have all of the features be accessible, it'd be really important for my family. It'd be something that we can do together. The student organizer of this event, Delaney Turner, has worked hard to create such a special event that will affect so many people. So Sibs was approached last April about helping Common Ground uh, fund their park and so Shannon McCalmont and myself decided that um, it would be a fun idea to bring the community together through a basketball game so throughout that time we've just been kind of formulating this event and we're here today so we're excited for it. A big thing that this park does is it really um, show it brings an awareness to inclusion. Um, oftentimes it just kind of goes over people's heads that there are people in wheelchairs who are unable to play on playgrounds, something simple that um, I think we take for granted. So uh, I think this will really bring an awareness to looking at the Cincinnati Royals and how skilled they are in this sport when a lot of times people view them as, oh, they're in a wheelchair, they have fewer abilities than I do, when in reality, you see them on the court like this and they just do an incredible job. Not only is this game introducing wheelchair basketball to Mason, but it's leaving a mark on the community and help create a playground for everyone. I'm Abby Miller, NBC Sports. The winter sports season has featured its share of top plays, as well as some we'd rather forget. Natalie Sears and Megan Rubesom have the good, the bad, and the ugly. What's up, Comic Country? I'm Megan Rubesom. And I'm Natalie Sears, and we're back to bringing you some of the best, worst, and ugliest moments in MHS sports. The start to our winter season has brought us some amazing highlights, but also some times when our athletes have not been on their A game. Coming in with the good, we've got some boys basketball. Noah Penalty is able to jump into the passing lane, poke the ball loose, and break away for an easy two points on the other end. Preseason track running the 60 meter dash. Well, it looks like Brian Hudnall had a nice trip there. Maybe we'll see him next fall. I don't know though, it kind of looked a bit trippy there. And for the ugly, we've got the boys basketball game against Lakota West. Senior Tanner Canoe sees an open lane and drives the ball to the basket. He goes up for the layup and it hits off the backboard. At least he's going up to the line to take a pair of free throws. Thanks for joining us on this edition of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. I'm Natalie Sears. I'm Megan Rupesom. And, and we'll, we'll see you next time. I dropped out, but you're still so perfect. You know, Millie, watching the sports section of our broadcast always gets me hyped for the season. Me too. Have you seen our new mascot, Cosmo the Comet? Of course I have, but I'm really not too sure about this whole Comet thing. That's why Aiden Crowley hit the halls to find out what you all think. The Comet has been a staple throughout the Mason community for as long as we remember, but we wanted to know if it's time for a change. So we asked you kids in the hall, if you could rename the Comets and have a new mascot, what would it be? 
I would say the meteors, because the meteors and comets are sort of the same thing, but they're just a different intergalactic position, you know what I'm saying? Jerry Miller? The Tigers. Uh, we should rename them the Mason Muskrats because <gasps> very ferocious animals, you know, got the teeth. Oh, this is a good one. The... Oh. The, so, so if we're renaming the mascot, probably the asteroids. All right. Uh, a skyline cracker. The Bengals. No. Yeah. I think it should be a um, not a tiger. It should be a a big dragon that blows out fire every time they score a touchdown or um, win a game, like a basketball three pointer. The Bengals. Yeah. McDonald's um burger. Tanner DeGroff. The moms. The uncle's son of your daughter. The dads. Bronchitis. The mason thumbs. A lion. Whether it's the muskrats, the moms, or the dads, something tells me that the comet is here to stay. But for now, I'm Aiden Crowley, NBC News. Despite all of those awesome new names, I know we'll always be comic country. Exactly, Millie. Thank you for joining us on this edition of NBC News. As always, we're committed to bringing you the news of students making the news. A lot of hard work goes in this broadcast, and we couldn't do it without our amazing cast and crew. For everyone in front of and behind the camera, I'm Millie Ortega. And I'm Haley Dardis.